Hi folks, Dr. Pulsifer here to talk about the long-term prospects in the war in Ukraine. Now, this presentation is not directly about game design, though game designers must figure out what's important in the situation they are modeling, unless they're not, um, they're making an abstract game, they're not modeling something. This is especially important in war games, which pretty much have to be models of some reality, even if it's a fictional reality. Now in games and life, the long-term view is usually more important than the short-term, as I talk about in other videos. Here we're looking at the long-term prospects in the apparently short-term stalemated war in Ukraine. Now, what about the progress? Well, neither side in Ukraine appears to be able to make a breakthrough on the front lines. Ukraine's summer offensive petered out. Russia's attacks in Avdivka and Kupiansk have achieved virtually nothing but losses for Russia. The best frontline prospect is Ukraine's advance in Kherson going over the Dnipro River. But we can ask which side has better prospects. Well, let's consider the front lines first. Russia paid heavily for taking Bakhmut, far more than Ukrainians did, and the Russians are paying even more heavily to try to take Avdiivka, especially in armored vehicles. They've lost hundreds. Shifts in the heavily fortified mine front line now are minuscule, especially in Avdiivka. Minefields make quick progress nearly impossible. The only promising area, again, for any, either side is the Ukrainian probes on the left back, bank of the Dnipro, where there's not a lot of minefields. Now, the long-term view is that Russia's economy is failing due to sanctions and internal weaknesses. This takes time, but it is certainly happening. For example, they have fuel shortages for cars and heating in a country that exports huge amounts of petroleum or tries to. Their income declines, even if you rely on official figures. And of course, how do you know a Russian official is lying? Their lips are moving. Their civil aviation is crippled by lack of parts. Their auto industry is prostrate state. The ruble is under pressure. There's a high borrowing rate, and so on. Now, what about logistics? Well, Napoleon Bonaparte said, amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics. Russia suffers from logistics problems, even when the Kerch Bridge is intact. That's the bridge between Russia and Crimea. The geography of the area generally favors Ukraine. For example, the Russian logistics along the land bridge, which in the main part of Ukraine, not in Crimea, are under threat because as the Ukrainians get longer range weapons, they can attack the roads. They can attack the railroads. And of course, the Kerch Bridge has been hit twice in the past, even though the Ukrainians don't have sufficiently long range weapons. Somehow they've managed to successfully attack it. Sooner or later, Ukraine will be given sufficiently long-range missiles to attack the bridge. And if the railroad bridge is knocked out, Crimea is in serious trouble as to supplies. What about the sea and the air? Well, Russia's fleet is impotent and has fallen back to bases further east, even against a country with no navy and hardly any air force. Serpent Island was abandoned by Russia. The oil platforms west of Crimea are now in Ukrainian hands. The grain deal is no longer needed by Ukraine because of the Russian retreat. The Russian Air Force, including helicopters, mostly stays out of the way. Russia was supposed to have a big advantage with their Navy and Air Force, but it hasn't turned out that way. And the Ukrainian F-16s, when they get them, are unlikely to change that stalemate. What about a materiel? And I say materiel, not material. That's a word that denotes equipment for war. Russia relies on faulty old North Korean ammunition, 
which blows up their own guns and is poor for accuracy because it's inconsistent, because it's so old and not well made. Russia's equipment in general is getting older and older, especially the armored vehicles. We see T-55s from 70 plus years ago coming to the front. We see World War I rifles being used, the lack of proper clothing, lack of armor, and general corruption. And quite apart from all that, Russia suffers heavy losses. Even their medicine is not good. And we can talk specifically about casualties. Russia has suffered horrendous casualties compared with Ukraine. This is thanks to Russian tactics. For example, the meat wave, where they just send troops forward. They don't send many armored vehicles because the armored vehicles get wiped out. And they just keep sending more and more men. And sometimes they send enough to force the Ukrainians to retreat. But an awful lot of people get killed. Of course, the Ukrainians, in contrast, try to preserve their own manpower, their trained manpower. And so if it gets too hot, they retreat. But often they can counterattack and retake a place. Then we have the unreliability in the age of Russian equipment. Again, corruption is rampant. And Ukraine benefits from newer, though still old, Western equipment. Much of the Western equipment that gets to Ukraine is no longer being used in the West because of its age, but it's newer than the Soviet equipment that the Russians use. There are not enough Russian troops currently to provide for rotation off the front line, and they suffer from poor training. The Ukrainians rotate off the front line. And by the way, neither side's going to run out of men. Uh, a rule of thumb is that 10% of the population of a country can be in the military when they're fully mobilized. And of course, 10% of even Ukraine is about 4 million. So there's not a situation where anybody's going to run out of men. If somebody tells you, oh, the Ukrainians are running out of men, they're full of shit, period. Now, what about nuclear weapons? Russia has made threats many times, and now no one believes them. On the other hand, Russia is very vulnerable to nukes. The main part of Russia is around Moscow and St. Petersburg, and those are easy targets and easily wiped out. And of course, the Russians can't even intercept drones, let alone nuclear missiles. There's always a chance if Putin dies that some maniac will want to start using nukes which may lead to the destruction of the world, but certainly will result in the destruction of Russia. And people say, why risk destruction? Well, you can't knuckle under to nuclear blackmail, because if you do, it will keep happening again and again and again. So the crux, the key question is whether the West will provide sufficient supplies to Ukraine continuously. If they do, Russia will fail in the long run. Unfortunately, it isn't a short war, and it isn't going to be a short war. It hasn't been so far. Also, unfortunately, USA Republicans have abandoned their history of opposing quote-unquote communism and the USSR, especially Trump and company. So the next election is very important, and many American voters are not just stupid, but abysmally stupid or deluded. We can also ask, what if Putin who is evidently sometimes unwell, dies. He's over 70 years old. Now in war, many things can go wrong, but right now the Russians are behind the eight ball. Who knows how it will play out in the end? Thanks for listening.